when I refer to globalization, I'm specifically talking about economic globalization. The, the institutions that deprive individuals and more specifically communities of their decision-making power, the institutions that deprive communities of their abilities to be economically sovereign, of their abilities to be politically sovereign, of their abilities to have their own cultural identity. That's how I'm defining globalization. And when we look at this region in particular, Lebanon, occupied Palestine, Iraq, we find that globalization here takes extraordinarily destructive forces and it has very ugly visions. In Iraq particularly we have seen it with the deliberate intent of the United States and its allies to destroy Iraqi agriculture, to destroy any aspect of public systems in Iraq. We noticed that at the beginning of the occupation in 2003, the first thing the United States did was dismantle all public sectors in Iraq, dismantle them. Actually, let me rephrase, they worked to dismantle them. They, their objective was to dismantle them. And one of the reasons that they were not successful in fully dismantling the public system was because of the resistance that arose in Iraq, because of the rise of unemployment as a consequence of the destruction and the potential destruction of the public systems. But what we saw in Iraq was the desire to subvert, to control, to destroy an economy with the military means and not simply through the powers of the World Trade Organization. Really? And what we saw in Iraq was the ability to destroy a country's economy, to destroy a country's ability to be sovereign, through military power, through military destruction, and unfortunately through more than one country's military power. And the struggle in Iraq continues. And it's not only a struggle for national liberation from the foreign occupation, it's also a struggle for economic liberation. Really? In the occupied territories, we have seen that as well. Where the struggle is not simply apartheid and occupation in 1948 Palestine and in the occupied territories, but it's also a struggle of economic equity. It's a struggle of civil rights. It's a struggle of environmental justice. So we find that struggle there. And in Lebanon, in addition to that, although Lebanon is not under occupation, we are facing economic struggles. The debt in Lebanon is one of the highest debts in the world, in the sense that the interest on the debt in Lebanon is higher than the GDP in Lebanon. So at the rate that our current government is going, Lebanon will be permanently in debt and it will continue work to sell off more and more of its assets to private corporations. And the situation in Lebanon isn't so much whether they're foreign corporations or national, but the fact that they're privately run, working for private interests and not working for public interest. So again, we have different faces of globalization in this region. Really? I think if you want to have a visual example of what globalization means to the world, you can go to Iraq and look at the so-called green zone and the so-called red zone. The world outside of the green zone and the world inside the green zone. Inside the green zone, which is heavily fortified, heavily militarized, you'll find American stores, American foods, American troops, as well as a semblance of peace and security. All with, again, heavy military fortification at extraordinarily financial expense. But you go outside of this green zone, and you'll find a country being torn apart with violence. You'll find a country where unemployment has continued to increase since the early 1990s. You'll find a country where there are car bombs and numerous other aspects of violence and where people are struggling, again, to be economically sovereign. In many ways, if we take that vision of Iraq today as a consequence of US occupation, that is globalization. We have a minority group that is continuing to get smaller and continuing to get richer at the expense of and with the resources of the majority. So the ugly face of globalization can be seen in Iraq just as it can be seen in, in New Orleans with Hurricane Katrina that devastated the communities in New Orleans where it was the poor and the disempowered and the disenfranchised whose homes were destroyed and ironically the very first company that was sent into New Orleans to help the people was not the Red Cross was not food distribution, was not the police, but was a private security firm by the name of Blackwater. The same private security firm that takes its contract at no-bid contracts from the US government 
and commit some of the most heinous war crimes in Iraq. The same company. So we see that not only does globalization look very similar around the world, but it possibly also operates under the same institutions, under the very same companies. Consequently, I think it becomes vital for us around the world who are suffering from globalization in these kinds of economic globalizations and are struggling either voluntarily or involuntarily to resist it, for us to recognize any anti-war movement needs to also be an anti-economic globalization movement. And any anti-economic globalization movement needs to also be an anti-war movement. And both of these movements need to recognize and be also anti-Zionist. Because Zionism itself is based on both these philosophies of denying people decision-making, being built on racism, stealing the resources from other communities, and giving to the ones who have little need from it. That is what Zionism is doing in Palestine 1948 and in the occupied territories. So we find there is a link between all these situations. And what we need to be doing is going back and recognizing environmental justice, economic justice, they're the same struggle. And they need to become, once again, the same movement. You know, in some ways we can say that globalization perhaps begun with strength and, and with, with its most vehemence some 500 years ago when Christopher Columbus quote unquote discovered the inhabitant continent of the Americas and began the genocide and began the destruction and began the rape and theft of that entire continent and the destruction of indigenous communities. We see that happening here again in the sense that there is this viewpoint from the West that the West has control of all the resources of the world. There's a common statement that was said in the US, which is, what is our oil doing under their soil? In reference to Arab soil, with the concept being that, of course, everything has to be American. But the struggle in this region is not simply a struggle over oil. And it's not simply a struggle over water. It's also a struggle over control itself. If we look at the map of the world, and we look at where US military bases have been, and where they have become in the past 10 years, we see that in addition to control over oil and future control over water and control over general economies, there is also a very strong desire and a very strong plan to have more and more US military bases placed in strategic centers. So we have seen right now, there's going to be one of the largest US embassies, if not the largest US embassy in the world, being placed in occupied Iraq. We know that in the Gulf, from Kuwait to Dubai to Bahrain to Qatar, we have some of the largest US military bases, particularly the US naval bases are very strong in the Gulf. So we have an expansion of this area. And here, in certain institutions, not as government, but in certain institutions, in Hezbollah in Lebanon, in some aspects of the Iranian government, and I stress only some aspects, there is resistance to this. It's not resistance based on the full understanding of economic globalization. It's resistance based on the simple understanding that a military conquest in this region would mean the destruction of certain communities. And what we have happening here on a larger scale is what happens to a simple neighborhood when a Starbucks comes into the neighborhood and people must decide, do they support their local coffee and resist the Starbucks? Or do they go and drink the really bad coffee of Starbucks like what, quote, the majority are doing? In this region, there is a very strong movement led by the United States to push these governments to, quote, normalize with Israel, to have full economic relationships with Israel, to accept so-called peace, otherwise known as surrender with Israel. And there is one movement that's working in that. And there is another movement that recognizes, no, we will not have economic trade with Israel so long as Israel continues to occupy and dispossess and um, impose apartheid against the Palestinians. We will not do that. One of the conditions for Lebanon to join the World Trade Organization, which unfortunately the Lebanese government has asked to join, is that Lebanon must open economic relationships with Israel. So we see there, there, there's a force, there, there, there's this imposition, not only an economic imposition for us to eat what these multinational companies want us to eat, for us to dress the way they want us to dress, for us to dress, for us to disregard our agriculture and our, our local traditions in terms of, of economic strength, but also 
to be involved in our national struggle for liberation, our national struggle for sovereignty, by imposing on us economic trade with Israel and thus taking from us perhaps the most powerful weapon we have in the struggle against Israel, which is the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. So again, globalization is much more than where we choose to drink our coffee and whether we choose to buy Nike or not Nike, as important as those decisions are. In this region, as in other regions around the world, it is truly a question of survival or a complete disintegration of our identity and life with our head bowed very, very low.